Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning and good evening to those of you who are joining through the live stream. It is such a huge honor to be in the room with so many true heroes and to be able to gather for such an important topic. Some 80 plus years ago when Freedom House was founded, it was very much done so to unite Americans against the threat of Nazi fascism. Um, and at that time, our founders very much recognized that isolationism, that turning a blind eye was not an option. And it was based on this idea of a false choice, that there was a zero-sum game between our interests and our values, between domestic challenges and universal human rights. But indeed, we know then and we know now that our interests and our values are deeply intertwined and the line between domestic and international is faint if it exists at all. Our world was then and remains now far too interconnected for that type of thinking. Today, authoritarianism is once again surging. We've heard that from so many of our great colleagues. As, regime, as regimes spread repression beyond their borders and take advantage of new technologies to surveil and harass and control dissidents and human rights defenders. And these threats and the brave people who defend against them, that is the raison d'etre of our conversation today and of organizations like those who are gathered here. I'm deeply thankful to Shirsi Flugstad and the Nobel Peace Center for organizing today's special gathering and Mayor Borgen for kindly inviting us to take part and for our Nobel laureates who are just an inspiration to all of us today. This conference couldn't have come at a more important time. For the past 17 years, Freedom House has been tracking global decline in political and civil rights, driven mostly by authoritarian pressure, but compounded by the backsliding within powerful democracies as well. Our Freedom in the World report, which many of you know, has tracked this global trend in democracy for more than half a century. But what we also know is thanks to the hard work of activists like those gathered here, more countries are free today than they were when we began reporting 50 years ago, up 30% in 1973 to 43% of the countries that are free today. But the bad and difficult news of that is that individuals, human beings, there are fewer today that are living in freedom. What we know, our research shows that 80% of the world's population lives in a country that is partly free or not free at all. That means that only one in every five, 20% of the world's population can claim that they live in a free country. And that is a difficult crisis for us to address. It is the great challenge of our time. And the struggle for freedom that those numbers indicate, the real lives that are behind those numbers is our shared challenge and it begins with human rights defenders. Many of you know the story of Thierry Singh. She was orphaned by Cambodian genocide. Seven-year-old Thierry and her brothers fled their homeland in 1980, first to Thailand and then to the United States. They became citizens, and Thierry grew up to be a passionate human rights lawyer. In 2004, she returned to her homeland, to Cambodia, to advocate for human rights and help rebuild its democracy. Despite 20 years of iron-fisted rule by Prime Minister Hun Sen, Thierry was hopeful. But she couldn't help but notice that, faced with the dynamic pro-democracy movement building in Cambodia, Hun Sen was only tightening his grip on power, going so far as to shut down all of the independent newspapers and ban political parties. Thierry blasted Hun Sen on social media, rallied support for political opposition leader Sam Ramsey, and all of that courageous work, all of that good work resulted in her being charged with treason. And in June 2022, she was convicted alongside dozens of co-defendants and transferred to a remote facility in a far-flung village where she remains today. Similar story to we've heard so many times, isolated from her families and her lawyers and cut off from all contact. Her story is so common but so unique, and it exemplifies the two, true price of freedom. And no one knows that better than those human rights defenders who are here who risk everything to make the world better, not just for their communities and societies, but ultimately for all of us. 
We see that so vividly in Ukraine, where everyone, as we heard just now, are fighting for the lives against the genocidal policies of Vladimir Putin, whose repression will undoubtedly spread if he is not soundly defeated on the battlefield. We've heard the story of Jan Roshinsky, who demonstrated such extraordinary bravery at last year's Nobel Prize ceremony. The Kremlin warned him not to accept the prize on behalf of Memorial, and he called their bluff in a ceremony in which he spoke the truth about Putin's war of conquest. And that is what we learn from our colleagues who are the courageous human rights defenders. We know that this type of activism has always been difficult in many parts of the world, but we know that there is an even stronger attack now. In the, mid in the mid-2000s, our research found that there was a growing trend of authoritarianism working more closely, more collaboration between authoritarian nations than we had ever seen. And what we saw was freedom of expression, assembly, activism, under attack like it had never been from many different places. Our data show that from 2006 to 2019, there was an erosion of all of these rights drastically in 85 countries where only 35 were making progress. So I want to point to two trends which are particularly concerning for us. First, that authoritarians are consistently attacking international institutions in order to build that support for the work that they are doing at home. Whether it's the Chinese government taking over a more aggressive role in the UN Human Rights Council, or the work that we saw by Beijing and Moscow to put um, leadership in the International Telecommunications Union, which effectively um, exercises control over the internet, we see this attack on the system that was put in place so many years ago to, in order to, to build a world that is just and peaceful. A second trend that many of you know about and many of you probably have experienced is that of transnational repression. Between 2014 and 2021, we have seen at least 36 countries have reached beyond their borders to intimidate, harass, kidnap, or murder exiled dissidents and members of the diaspora community. One of our colleagues that we work with, Masi Alinejad, is a courageous Iranian activist who started her activism as a journalist in Iran, and she was forced to flee to the United States only to find that the Iranian government went after her there. Our, our uh, FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, uncovered an Iranian plot in the United States to kidnap her. It is that terrible story that is the truth for so many activists in exile now. She left her home in Iran to flee repression, and not even living in a free country could guarantee her safety. That is the challenge that we have now, and so the question before us that we are looking at as we're seeing these attacks on international institutions, we're seeing these attacks on human rights defenders at home and remarkably abroad as well, what will we leave for our children and their children, a world where those authoritarian actors are able to reach their long arm into international organizations, into other countries, and continue to repress at home, or will we leave a world that values fundamental freedom? Those working on the front lines to uphold and protect fundamental freedoms are the true agents of positive change in their countries, but fundamentally in our world. And we desperately need solidarity and support for them at the individual and the systemic level. They are not just fighting for their nations. They are courageously doing that, but they are indeed fighting for all of us and freedom around the world. That is why Freedom House has proudly endorsed the Nobel Peace Center's Sunflower Declaration, and we support greater support internationally for human rights defenders. On the individual level, we are strongly advocating for the security and resources to human rights defenders, journalists, oppositionists, and others so that they continue their work at home. But for those who flee persecution, unrest, and imprisonment, we know that we must support them where they find refuge. We have long advocated for democratic governments to create a flexible, rapid response, temporary protective visa system for human rights defenders who are facing danger, and to seek the unconditional and immediate release of political prisoners, and to combat transnational repression of human rights defenders in exile. 
We know that there is much that democratic nations can and must do in order to support our colleagues who are on the front lines of freedom. We can support them by supporting the international system to push back on international authoritarianism. And authoritarianism. We can and must stand up guardrails to ensure that our leaders of international agencies, wherever they might be, are committed to the principles of democracy and human rights, and that they, that our democratic colleagues also become places of refuge and solace for those who are fighting for human rights. I could talk much more about the great uh, threats that are facing our human rights defense colleagues, but I can also speak at much more length about their extraordinary bravery, the power of their human fundamental yearning for freedom, and the very good reasons for hope um, that good will, will prevail in time. So let me leave this with this. The efforts and sacrifices our human rights defenders benefit all of us, not just in one country in one moment of time. They are indeed fighting for freedom for generations to come, and they need and deserve our support because they are truly in the fight for freedom for us all. Thank you.